Can you hear? Does that work? Okay. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming after lunch. Um, I know that second day after lunch is a hard time for keeping energy levels high, so we'll try to do our best here. Um, our presentation is is on uh, creating prioritization tools. So um, we'll try to keep that as interesting as we can. <laughs> uh, I'm Scott Duran, Adam Donald. We both work for Water Systems Consulting. Um, we have been doing quite a bit of water master planning work and asset management work for our clients. And I, I guess one of the things we've been seeing is that we're kind of in this new era where we have so much data at our fingertips that we can use to make decisions. And yet it seems like it never fails. We're always missing like something important, something that we need to, to make those kind of prioritization decisions. So our presentation today is to share some of the stories, hopefully give you guys some takeaways on um, what we found useful for some of our clients and give you ideas on how you might tailor it for your systems. So why is prioritization important? I think one of the things we're seeing most of the work now is around addressing our aging infrastructure. We're not getting as much like um, new, new work with our clients particularly. It seems like a lot of infill and just dealing with I&I &I that's eating up capacity of lines, um, aging pump stations. And so, you know, having a good risk-based prioritization system can really help you make sure that you're spending your money on those high priority items that maybe aren't rising to the surface in your annual budgeting process where, you know, sometimes it's the squeaky wheel that gets the oil, but there might be a really big risk lurking in your system. And if you can deal with that in a proactive way, it can certainly be much better than an emergency situation. So having a prioritization tool also helps you communicate your needs to your elected officials when you're asking for you know, budget to address these things. Uh, what we've seen is like, now that we can do these we have all the data to model the collection system down to like every last foot, we end up finding a lot more deficiencies. And so the CIP lists can be shocking when you haven't done your master plan in 10, 20 years. Um, so what softens the blow though, is to have a prioritization system that goes with that, that you can say, look, we're, we're gonna tackle these things year by year and they're gonna be based on the highest risk. Um, and then finally, often just going through the effort of doing the prioritization helps you realize what, what data might actually be the most meaningful and, and make sure that you're collecting that. Uh, so our agenda, we're, we'll talk just kind of what goes into the risk-based prioritization elements at a broad level, and then walk you through a few examples of simple Excel-based tools through GIS. And then, um, you know, City of Portland has pretty elaborate SQL server and Tableau driven dashboards that they can use. Um, and then we'll, we'll close with a few implementation considerations. So the main elements of risk-based prioritization, everybody's probably seen this graphic, but consequence of failure, likelihood of failure, you know, the product of those two is gonna put you in the highest risk. That's where you really wanna be prioritizing your needs. Um, and I, I think that, turning this into a numerical system is really helpful in, in both communicating with folks, numbers tell the story and, and being able to say why one, one project or one asset might need repair over another um, can be really helpful. Um, so one thing about consequence of failure, if you're trying to calculate it, put it into a numerical system, you need to tie it back to something consistent across the board. So tying it to your level of service is really important. Um, the photo there is a, a failed 48 inch sewer in California that dumped eight and a half million gallons onto a beach. Um, and I think that that's an extreme event, keeps us up at night. Nobody wants to have that happen and be in the papers. But really, um, when you're looking at risk, that might not be the scenario that you're, you know, you're evaluating consequence of failure around. It might be something lower than that, but it's important to be consistent and often have a consequence of failure for any part of your system be fairly static so that you don't, you're not recalculating all the time. You're figuring out what happens if this thing fails. Um, the level of complexity of how you do this is important. Obviously it's gonna take a lot more time, the more complex it is. So we've seen very effective use of just qualitative ranking of different um, failures. You know, that could be as simple as a one, two, three or no impact, minor, major. 
Um, it can tell you a lot. You know, qual quantitative can be valuable when you're dealing with things that are vastly different size. So, you know, an eight inch wastewater main failing is going to have a much different magnitude than a 48 inch um, interceptor, right? So, um, some systems are going to benefit from having a little more gradation. And then I think the the high end would be if you try to quantify your consequence of failure, um, it can be really great, but it also adds more complexity because you're having to figure out what are your triple bottom line costs. Um, some of those things can actually be a bit tricky to put dollars to if you're going to defend it as a reason for prioritizing one project over another. Um, and then likelihood of failure, that's usually what changes more over time. That's the part of these tools that has to get updated frequently. Often we're tying that back to condition. Um, but there's other, there's other like, there's other factors that could contribute, but condition is usually the simplest. If you're just using a visual condition score and, and translating that into likelihood of failure, it does require, you're going to have to have those scores for all your assets. So that can take a little bit of time to pull together and to refresh on some kind of cycle. Remaining useful life is a little more complicated. That's where we need to know when things were installed. And that's often where a lot of the big data gaps are. Um, you know, just record keeping uh, wasn't as good, um, you know, 40, 50 years ago. So, um, and then moving towards, you know, there's some examples of statistical remaining useful life where if you have a lot of assets and you can gather good data, you can develop Weibull curves, you know, that would translate condition into actual, how many years left do I think I have for this asset? But those, those work well for pipelines. Um, I think for other types of facilities, it can be a little more complex and hard to get enough data to make it meaningful, but that would be the high end. So we'll get into a few case studies. Um, we have four clients that we've done uh, some form of a, developing a tool in the last few years. Um, all of them are specific. Every single agency had some unique thing they were wanting to look at. So we'll share a few of the details on those. Um, uh, I'll talk about Placer County and Adam will talk about the Milwaukee and Oak Lodge Water Services tools. And then we'll close with City of Portland. So Placer County, if you don't know where that is, it's north of Sacramento. It's a pretty large county. Um, and they have 47 pumping stations. That's what we were focused on. They cover a very wide area. They did a really robust condition assessment effort 10 years ago, and they generated like that. This is just a few screenshots, but like 20, 30 page reports for every single station. Pretty cool. But like 10 years later, you can imagine that's not, not easy to replicate and update. And so um, that's kind of where they're at. So we always start these things off with workshops, you know, getting all the stakeholders, stakeholders together finance, engineering, operations, you know, the decision makers, and try to figure out what is really unique. So for Placer County, they don't have great GIS capabilities. They're super concerned about electrical reliability. They're in the foothills of the Sierra Nevadas. They get snow, they get fires. And so um, that was one of their top concerns. Also, because there's such a geographically wide area, if they have a failure, they can't get to the station very quickly. And so having ability to contain spills on site was also a high priority. Um, and then they wanted like just a simple thing they could bring into monthly management meetings and be able to look at and not, you know, not spend a lot of time trying to figure out where things are. So for consequence of failure, we just, we boil it down to four criteria. We just gave them each a one to four scale. They're really about the risk of a spill for these pump stations. And so, um, consequence of failure tied to the flow coming into the station. Peak wet weather flow is one. They also, they have a daisy chain system. So some stations have three, four, five pump stations upstream. So that was another critical factor. Uh, spill impacts was really about if there is a spill on the side, we had a failure, we can't get there fast enough. What's happening to the spill? Is it going, is it staying on site? due to the geography or we have some storage or is it you know going into an irrigation canal or a, a body of water and then finally time to overflow is one that was important to them they recently have been putting in storage in all of their stations to capture a fair amount um, just because they might be two hours away but older stations don't have that so they want to use that as a tool to kind of like prioritize the stations that don't have any storage and likely to failure was, uh, we looked at health and safety and then criticality and condition. And so 
uh, we just created some very simple checklists for them to run through, um, looking for any major health and safety. The, probably the most predominant one would be like, older stations didn't have great fall protection on the wet wells. So that would be a major thing. And then there was some minor, what they called minor, um, like if there wasn't lighting that they could work at night, that was one they wanted to flag. And then we went through the criticality and condition of, of um, the structures, the pipes, the electrical system and the site. A few other things they wanted to capture was vulnerability. So they wanted to track whether the electrical equipment was in a building or not because of some of the things they deal with um, weather-wise. They also haven't had a chance to do arc flash on all of their sites. And so they wanted to have that visible. And then just when was the last major overhaul of station? Just having that all visible in the tool was another feature that was unique to them. And so this is what it looks like, you know, it's a spreadsheet, but it's, it's pretty good. It's got a lot behind it. There's, there's tabs that uh, would capture all the information for each individual station. And I don't have a pointer, but, um, but you know, we have a few macros in there that allow you to sort around different things, um, but nothing that they can't maintain over time. Um, and then uh, basically it's just aggregating that consequence of failure, likelihood of failure into a score so they can see what rises to the top, but they could still sort by stations that have high consequence of failure or they can track, you know, um, the last column on the right is captures how their electrical equipment is protected. Um, so it captures some of the unique things they, they wanted, but it's a pretty simple tool. And then where we're at in the process, so we, we reviewed the data, built the pilot tool. Their team has now taken that and is populating it with condition data. They have one engineer who's working with their operations lead and they're just cranking through stations, getting the data in. They're gonna stop at some point and that's kind of where we're at now is um, gauging the accuracy in, with management and seeing how everything's shaken out. Um, and then that'll get incorporated and, and um, maybe there'll be a few updates. But over time, you know, it's, I think the engineer is going to own the tool, but it's really going to be operations that'll be populating it once a year, just updating the conditions, making sure nothing major has changed. So it doesn't take a lot to maintain this and still give them a more visibility than they have now with up-to-date information. So key takeaway, you know, if you focus on what's key to your utility, keep it simple, it can be pretty, pretty useful. It doesn't have to take a ton of effort. Um, for Placer County, you know, tailoring it to their specific areas of concern. We have an extra weight on electrical equipment where if they have grid, if their grid isn't reliable where the station is and they have poor condition electrical equipment, it bumps it up quite a bit. So it's a way for us to like help them focus on those areas where they can't rely on the utility power. Um, so they really need to make sure their electrical equipment is great shape. And now it's Adam's turn. All right. Thanks, Scott. Uh, for the city of Milwaukee, we chose to use a GIS-based tool as part of the master plan. They wanted to do a, include the condition in their CIP. So quick background on them. They have five pump stations, about 80 miles of sewer pipe, and they had pretty good CCTV data. This is something they do every four years and it's continually replenished. And so that was something that we could leverage within that. Uh, like with Placer County, we met early on just to identify needs and concerns. Uh, we found that their, uh, the city had really robust GIS capabilities, so it allowed us to leverage a lot of data, <coughs> excuse me, and it was really well captured. So we had condition data, we had information on age, pump station basin, when it was last updated. Um, and then as far as the inspection data goes, they had a lot of that data, but there were some formatting issues, which we'll touch on in a bit. And then as far as some drivers, the city, I was really concerned about the Cascadia subduction zone earthquake that's anticipated in our lifetime. And so they wanted to look at seismic resilience. And as part of this, we actually did a small seismic study that looked at level of service goals and identifying a seismic backbone of pipe, which then played into our analysis here. And their maintenance staff wanted to be able to do repairs in house. So as we were pulling together recommendations, we wanted to keep that in mind and be able to filter out projects that could be done cheaper in in house versus what would need to be outsourced. So as far as the condition data, when we got in there, uh, we knew that they had a lot of CCTV data, but we found that only about fifty percent of it was really captured within GIS, and this was really due to the asset management system uh, being transferred. They had Granite XP to start with, which had condition data in a non-PACP format. 
So it was capturing your structural defects and your O&M defects, but it wasn't assigning scores to those in the same way. And so when they transferred over to GraniteNet, which is their current system, those scores were unable to be compatible with it. And so it was just lost. And so what you see on the screen here, just a bunch of null columns. And so we had about 50% of score data. And then we had, uh, we still had all the videos, but it wasn't really in our scope to review that many hours of videos. Uh, so we wanted to make best use of what we could with that. And we did a risk-based factor system. So for consequence of failure, uh, previously the city just used a system of one to three based on the pipe size. And while that's good, we wanted to look at a more robust solution that gave them more of a triple bottom line style where you're looking at capital costs, social impacts, and environmental impacts. And so we kept the uh, pipe size as one factor, but instead of on a one through three system, we bumped it to a one to six to align with uh, what NASCO does with their PACP on the likelihood of failure side. Uh, we also looked at you know, constituents that would be impacted. So if a main fails, is it gonna impact a majority of users of the system or is it more of a smaller subset? On the seismic side, uh, we really wanted to understand, is it part of that backbone since that was such an important asset to them? Uh, and it's really critical for maintaining those level of service goals. If there's a failure there, that has huge implications for them meeting that level of service. We also looked at pipe depth on just a more simple scale. So the deeper a trench, the more uh, level of effort that is, as well as a uh, road type. If you're in a busier street, you're gonna require much heavier traffic control than you would in a cul-de-sac, for example. And then lastly, we looked at environmental impacts based off of uh, how it would impact water bodies in the event of a failure. Uh, on the likelihood of failure side, we really leveraged uh, NASCO's system. So for those of you not familiar with PACP, one of the our outputs you get is a quick score. And it can tell you a lot about uh, what's going on with that pipe. So defects are on a one to five scale, uh, with fives being something you'd want to replace within the first, like the next five years, because failure is fairly imminent, all the way down to a one where you're not really concerned at all. And so a quick score, we can see at a glance what the really high level defects are and the amount that's there. And for the factor system, it's really quite simple. You just divide those first two digits by 10 and you have your factor that you can then use in the risk analysis. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the city wanted to self-perform some repairs. And so we were able to leverage this quick score data to understand if it was a good fit for just a simple repair by the city. So oh, what we see on the screen is a 5121. And so we have one grade five defect and one grade two defect on this pipe. And so the grade five defect is likely a break or a hole and something that you could excavate down and replace or do some sort of spot liner to address. And then, then you're down to a two and that's, you really don't need to do too much. So you don't have to really rehabilitate this whole line. You can uh, just get in there do that one repair and then move on. Uh, but we were reminded of the importance of QAQC through this process. So uh, the recommendations that you get are really only as good as the data that you have. So using that methodology I was just talking about, we identified 46 potential point repairs out of the 50% of data that we had. And we sent those over to their operations supervisor just to do a review of the videos. We found that 59% of them didn't actually need spot repairs. And it really came down to three things. Uh, occasionally, this was only like one or two, uh, something was miscoded. And so it was artificially raising that score. And then uh, a couple others were just outdated videos where uh, we got the data set. And in that month from when we were doing the analysis, uh, they had addressed that repair already. And so we just were dealing with an outdated video. And the biggest thing was laterals. Uh, the city doesn't own their laterals. They put everything on the property owner. And so these lateral defects were triggering point repairs uh, on that list, but instead they were able just to issue enforcement notices to those homeowners, get those addressed, and then we really reduced that uh, list down to maximize their resources. Uh, so putting it all together for our living tool, we, we put it into GIS and so you have access with, uh, with maps. So you'll notice on this screen, there's a couple things. Uh, the thicker lines is that seismic backbone for maintaining that level of service. And so uh, we wanted to really make that pop just to inform. And you'll see a lot of the red is on that backbone. And so those are very high risk pipes. 
And then half the system is in pink because we just didn't have data for that. And so over time, this maps, that pink's gonna go away. We're gonna have risk scores for those. And this will be something that uh, city official or city staff can just pull up and at a glance have up-to-date data to make decisions. And so how do we maintain that? Uh, it's a fairly simple streamlined process. So the city's uh, CCTV every four years and they have that data constantly coming in. That's gonna flow into their asset management system at the end of the day, which is GraniteNet and that can sync with GIS. And so you're getting all of those likelihood of failure and quick scores just pulled in. The consequence of failure exists within GIS and that doesn't change unless the pipe changes. So if you upsize the pipe significantly, consequence might change, but generally that's constant. And then the risk just cal is calculated by multiplying those. So you get updated scores and then you can pull updated lists of recommendations, do any QA, QC efforts that are needed to strip out anything from bad data and run through your CIP process. So a couple of key takeaways from this project that we learned was you know, QA, QC is really important. We wanna make sure we're leveraging resources most efficiently. And it's often a step that can get, be neglected if we're on a tight timeline, but uh, in this case, it had a really significant impact. And then service laterals were skewing results. And so this may be uh, unique to the city in that not all utilities uh, have the luxury of just uh, putting that onto the homeowner, but that was something that we were able to leverage with them. So our next case study is with Oak Lodge Water Services. Uh, this is actually the utility just south of Milwaukee. So it's a similar size. We've got five pump stations and about 100 miles of sewer pipe, and they have their own water reclamation facility, whereas Milwaukee was treated by the county. And we're currently in the process of doing this master plan, and so this tool is still being worked out, but we were able to leverage some lessons learned. Uh, similar to the other ones, we, we met with them, and we identified that uh, GIS was pretty good here as well. They had dedicated staff that were maintaining it, and we were able to get accurate results from that. And they had CCTV data for almost all of their pipes, uh, which is really important for uh, making sure you have a holistic view of ma when making recommendations. Uh, we did find, though, that the condition reports were scattered across a number of different databases, which created some challenges on our end, which we'll touch on in a bit. And multiple asset IDs were present for all of these pipes, which can become a bit of a nightmare and um, just trying to keep everything straight. So on the consequence, consequence of failure side, uh, we used a factor system and uh, the district actually had a consequence of failure system they developed in-house and uh, they found that they'd spent a lot of time on it and they found that it was a pretty accurate uh, measure, uh, but really only two people were maintaining it and both of them left the district a few years back and unfortunately nobody knows where that data went. It's, it wasn't in GIS and nobody can find it. And so we tried to leverage what was done, but it's really just a lesson in succession planning where you want to make sure that there's ownership in this and that uh, people know where to find these tools. And so for just for example here, some of these were really easy to replicate, like a depth of the pipe that was readily available, but soil conditions, we didn't have any geotech. And so there wasn't any way for us to go in and we didn't have any documentation of how they did it before. So that had to be omitted. Uh, on the likelihood of failure side, uh, we had four different databases that resulted from various asset management systems and uh, pipeline softwares for the CCTV. And uh, we had to really reconcile that into something that could be used. So what you see on the left here is PACP data. This is their latest uh, version. So we get those quick scores that are really easy for analysis. Uh, but previous Asset management systems gave us different types of reports. So what you see on the right here is just a list of defects in a completely different format. There's no grading scale to them. And so we needed to find a way to merge these. And so what we decided to do is just emulate the PACP format. And so here on the screen, you'll see this is another version they had where it was coded in a different way. But we tried to take these various defects and assign uh, the PACP scores that made uh, the most sense in correlation. So some are really easy. A break in a pipe, a collapsed pipe, that was clearly a grade five. Fractures are clearly called out as a grade four in PACP. But others like roots are a little more ambiguous. PACP has a number of different scores for roots based on the severity, whether they're light, heavy, where they occur in the pipe. And we just had roots. So we just took something that was middle of the line 
and try to create something that we felt was uh, reasonable to use the data that we had and knowing that this is ultimately going to be improved over time as we get new new data. So right now we're in the process of the tool development. And so the flowchart here is what we're envisioning this tool to look like. So the CCTV data that they get will be in PACP format. It's going to flow into their asset management system, which is Lucidy. And then we're going to be exporting that into a calculation spreadsheet tool. So it's kind of a hybrid between what we did with Placer County and with Milwaukee, where we're leveraging spreadsheets as well as asset management GIS data. And all of these calculations will then be pooled. Um, once you just do the export, it's a data dump and it will all update on a calculation tab and pull together an updated risk list. Uh, we then go through that QAQC process of reviewing the actual videos to make sure it was reflective and then come to a CIP at the end. And so for this project, we had a couple of takeaways. Uh, just having data in a consistent format is really important. Uh, we spent a lot of time and effort trying to work these data sets into something that was usable. Uh, they started off as a PDF actually, so I had to export everything into Excel via the PDF and we had to merge them. And uh, it was just, we spent a lot of effort on that. And so having something that was consistent and easy to use uh, will be helpful going forward. And then you really need ownership of these tools. If the system's gonna continue to be successful and used, uh, staff needs to own it and we need to make sure people know where everything is so it can continue to have an impact. So I'm gonna pass it back over to Scott to talk through Portland DES. Okay, uh, so this Portland um, Bureau of Environmental Services, they're really on the, the complex end, you know, it's a bigger utility, pretty sophisticated utility. And so we help them with the pump station system plan, really looking at their pump stations. They have 97 pump stations in the city. Um, and I think, you know, they have a very robust asset management system. They track 6,500 assets just within those pump stations. So there's a lot of data to deal with here. Um, and I, I know we don't have a lot of time, so I won't go into a ton of detail, but um, this similar, we started out with some workshops for, the, for uh, Portland. The big thing was they, they, they have a very robust prioritization system they use on their collection system. Um, and they wanted to have a way to have as close as possible apples to apples where they could look at like a pump station project versus say a, a large sewer project and be able to say which one should they do first. And so that was part of it. They wanted to use their existing systems. They've invested a lot in tailoring their, their CMMS system and other tools. They didn't want to build another one on top of that. So how could we use those existing systems to drive prioritization? Um, and, and finally, maybe the biggest one was they needed a way to communicate to management that pump stations had been a little bit deferred maintenance over the years and was now starting to creep up as a major risk for the city. And so how do you do that? How do you communicate the need when there's all these other needs? Um, uh, and so, and finally, when you got 97 pump stations, a consistent way to gather your data is really important to make sure that um, one operator's opinion isn't, you know, making one station look worse than another. So um, what, what Portland does, I won't go into all the details on this, but they, the system they use on the collection side, they call it the net benefit cost ratio. And it, it's a way to quantify risk. So they put dollars to the risk and um, it's a pretty sophisticated system. It, it looks at your current risk status. So if you've got you know, a pump station that you think could fail any day, that, that presents a certain quantified risk they'll compare that with um, the project, the cost of the project that you would do to now uh, improve that risk profile. So it's the, the resulting future risk plus the cost of your project. The, the difference between those two quantified dollar amounts is your benefit, right? That's your benefit in terms of risk reduction. And then they divide that by the cost of the project as a way to normalize so that, you know, the big, big dollar projects aren't showing way more benefit relative to the dollars spent. And so what our challenge was to turn that into a system for pump stations. Um, they do this on the pipes. Pipes are fairly more straightforward. A pump station or a treatment plant has a lot more complexity into it can fail in any number of different ways, right? And so we have a, we've done a whole presentation on this topic. It's, it's fun to talk about, but um, I'll keep it simple in that the quantification has a lot of benefits. It allows you to do these things where um, helps you come up with like ideas for how you might maximize the life cycle. 
helps you understand the difference between plan and emergency costs and really where you're getting benefit there. Um, and, and a lot of times it ended up prioritizing spill risks. And so um, when it comes to quantified risk, I think one of the most powerful outcomes was there was some unique, um, some aha moments with the team of like, they have one station, the Inverness station, and I went to Portland, it's just like towers over the others in terms of risk. And it just hadn't, they needed to see that. Everyone knew it in their gut, but it's like, it's different when you see it in terms of dollars. And so it actually got a lot of things moving quickly uh, once, once people started looking at this graph. Uh, but then even across the whole system, when you add up the total cumulative risk of 97 pump stations, it allowed them to start a program and make, them out, make an ask for um, a continuous fund to start addressing these, these high risk stations um, you know, in, in the mix of all the other things that they're doing. And I won't walk through this whole workflow, but I, I think the takeaway is a quantified risk-based prioritization system takes a lot of manpower to maintain and update. So a utility like the city of Portland, Port, Portland has asset management department. They have condition assessment program. They have a lot of pieces that can pull us in, um, but it's cool. They're, every year, they're gonna be gradually updating this tool and building it out um, and using it to drive decision-making. So. Um, but if you're going to go that route, you just got to be ready to, to put in a lot of work. Um, um, but key takeaways, one thing that came out, there was that several pump stations that um, had never really been on anyone's radar. But when we started looking at time to overflow and response time that you might need to address the situation, they surprised everybody by rising to the top just because you realize if something goes wrong, you're not going to be able to get there. Uh, quick enough to save a spill. It's just that nothing's really gone wrong yet. Um, so that was a good takeaway. And, they, and there wasn't a good data on that. We had to actually go through and uh, work with the city to come up with what are those estimates for every station. And it, it, it generated some unique conclusions. And then um, finally, just the difference between operation, an operational viewpoint and an asset management or a risk-based viewpoint. The city had gone through and done criticality scoring for everything. But when you were thinking about criticality, from the standpoint of risk and failure and consequence, um, it was a whole different way of looking at it. So they were, for a good example would be, SCADA goes down, they lose visibility on the station. That's a high priority for them to get it back up and running. But in terms of causing an actual SSO or a, a situation, you can lose the SCADA and, and you know, station's gonna run off its backup control. So that was, that was an interesting kind of finding. Um, so finally, wrapping it up here, Implementation considerations, you know, if you're gonna have a living system, definitely wanna think about the costs, you know, Excel can be fairly easy to maintain, um, going all the way up to like, Portland has a SQL server that pulls from a bunch of different sources and translates that through Tableau into like these dashboards, super cool, but it does take a lot to maintain that. So, um, you know, you wanna definitely think through that as you're deciding what you want to go to. But but the good news is I think you can start small and build. You know, there's a lot of um, things you can start in Excel that could be easily translated over over time. So, and then finally, I'd say that if you're going to do a prioritization tool, it's going to become part of your workflow. It's going to help drive decision-making. It's going to be a change in behavior and you don't want to take that lightly. Change management is always hard, right? Um, so one thing I couldn't stress hard enough, don't just jump right in, build a pilot, a small portion of your system and run it through everybody and let them see it because what we found in every single one of these when you're talking in abstract about what this might look like you might think you're saying the same thing but people are seeing and visualizing different things in their mind so having a, a small sample that people can really start picking at helps get by and it helps you demonstrate especially to operations like why is the little bit extra work here to gather some of this information going to be valuable in decision making you can actually take that and start talking through how it's gonna drive decision-making and people can understand it better when they can actually see it working. Um, always get constant feedback from operations. I mean, they just can't say that enough. Um, and then finally, just having a dashboard, even if it's just a simple spreadsheet that gets brought up at a quarterly meeting that you have, it just helps people understand how you're making progress and why the, the maintenance of this tool is important because you can start to see your risk go down. That station that is it the, the highest or that pipe that's the highest risk seeing that come off the list? It really does impact people and it helps them understand why um, this information is useful. So 
anyway, that's it. Um, we'll leave it with questions. Um, and definitely if anybody wants to talk and geek out on this stuff, you can find Adam and I would be happy to share more information, but um, I'll stop there and see if anyone has questions. Thank you, great, uh, great, great presentation. Um, question about city of Milwaukee. Uh, you said you had uh, the CCT available for up there every four year um, inspections. Did you also have was this cleaning data available uh, for either emergencies and or you know hotspot mm -hmm. um, cleaning and were you able to use that? Uh, the reason I'm asking if clients that have great data, it seems, but it's not consistent. So we weren't able to use it very well as much as the CC, CCT needed. Gotcha. Um, yeah, they, do you want to answer one? Uh, yeah, just while I ask one. No. Uh, can you hear me? Um, so we, we did have some data. It was a small portion of their system that they had on an increased cleaning schedule. And so we did uh, look at that. And I think what ended up happening as we went through things is those were generally identified. Uh, but if they weren't, we wanted to make sure that still got incorporated into the CIP. And so, you know, every system, not any system is perfect, but we felt like it did an overall good job of capturing that. I heard something about it. Yeah, you can go ahead. Uh, I got a lot of boys. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, I heard you talk about the side sewer. Um, that they were a responsibility of the homeowners. Were they, uh, this is the Milwaukee one, I think. Um, were they part of the, the inspection? Did they inspect the side sewer when they did the rest of it? No, but what, what they did, they were coding defects at the lateral branches. And some of them were like, so they weren't sending like cameras up the side sewers, but they would stop the camera, look up the sewer. And if they found something, they would code it. Um, but Milwaukee has a, um, actually written in their code that the homeowner is responsible. So, so what was happening was flagging pipes, right? That had multiple lateral defects, but really they, the city was able to put that to code enforcement and then, you know, have those homeowners have to fix it in, I don't know, it was 30 days. Um, and so, so it was, it was throwing things off a little bit because we'd see a pipe that had a bunch of grade fives, but then you'd go through and the operators would look at me like, actually, those are all lateral defects. We don't have to deal with those. So Milwaukee's United, not every, most okay, of our clients don't like, have that in place. The main the person's house, it's private. Right. That's the way it's supposed to That's be. the way they, yep. Mm -hmm. How did they sign the risk dollars for controlling all that? Like, the risk uh, dollars? Uh, oh, man, we could talk for a long time about that. But they, they have a few, I'll, I'll give a few quick things. They, they, they have a general factor they can apply to emergency versus plan. They have they can they track their data so they know if something breaks in the middle of the night, it costs 40% more than if they could plan it. So that's one component. But they've also mapped, they've mapped the spill path for every single pump station and pipe. And they can tell you, and it, they use GIS, but they trigger if it goes past a school or if it's going to go over a road, they have all these different dollar numbers they put to it. It's pretty elaborate. Um, but they, you know, it was one of those things that sounds really difficult, but they went through once, did it. It's all in GIS now. So now that you do it once, you can easily click on anything and say, oh, I know what the consequence of failure of that asset is. So I think we're out of time. Getting the time's up, Flag. Yeah.